We've been exploring refuges, which are particularly in, important during turbulent times. Refuges, places of sanctuary, feelings, ideas, other people, activities that give us a sense of sanctuary, protection, and inspiration and refueling. And so I've been exploring some refuges, including recently the refuge of acceptance and uh, accepting the experiences you're having in the moment. Second, experience, accepting yourself as a person altogether, including the parts that have been disowned or pushed away. Accepting other people, including people that are difficult. And tonight, I want to talk about exploring and accepting worldly conditions, ranging from a dripping faucet that just won't stop all the way up to uh, global, global climate change. And so let's start by clarifying that it's easy to accept what we like. Acceptance is relevant for what we don't like or including ways in which we're motivated maybe to push things outside of awareness. And so in the field of that which there is to accept is some kind of unpleasantness, some kind of aversion, we don't like it. I suggest you pick something that is not political. Let's just start there. <laughs> Whatever it might be. Uh, I'm thinking of things that have happened in my extended family system that are probably irreversible at this point. Um, I can think right now of a call I got actually during the break um, from a relative of mine who is telling me about another relative is approaching the end of his life. Uh, you know, these are conditions. So you might pick conditions that are that you don't you wish were different. You don't want them. Maybe you're just tired of walking around with a mask on, and you wish you could go to the gym or work out without having to wear a mask. Stuff like that. Whatever it might be. Uh, maybe your shoes are too tight. Something. Clearly, when there's something we, we we have a hard time accepting, there are negative reactions to it. The first step is to be with those negative reactions. If we can't accept our aversive reactions, if we can't accept not accepting, then we'll never get to acceptance. So we have to begin with allowing. And if you prefer other words, find words that work for you. Allowing, acknowledging, surrendering to, bowing to, it's sometimes used as a metaphor for this, just it is what it is. No praise, no blame, like it or not like it, good, bad, ugly, north, south, east, west. It is what it is. It's like this, as Ajahn Sumedho talks about a way we can relate to our experiences. It's like this. So we have to begin by unpacking and exploring our reactions to what we don't like. Because of the brain's negativity bias, we tend to have heightened reactions, especially to what we find unpleasant. They are most inclined to invade our mind and remain. In other words, to occupy us and preoccupy us our negative reactions, generally more than grasping after things we enjoy. Yes, some people, some in some ways, we can get really caught up in what we want, you know, my precious, what, what we want to possess or enjoy. But very often, if you look at your, you know, problematic preoccupations, they're often about conditions that we don't like, including the frustration of getting what we would like. So step one, it's to be real about aversive reactions, you know, things that we find uncomfortable or we, we don't want or in our minds we rail against or we deny. These are very, very natural uh, reactions. So we have to start there. Second key point, critically key point, we can find the peacefulness of facing things as they are, squarely, and without adding the resistance to their factness, squeezing the rope of life in our hands, which burns. We can enjoy the, 
the value of acceptance, which I'll be exploring more in a moment, while reserving our own rights to see every little bit of the way it is and to see the way it is in reference to our values, morally, politically, compassionately, and to, you know, have our values, have our, have our view, even a moral view of things. And we can accept things while retaining our right to plan and to take action. So we can, for example, fully um, accept the fact that the faucet is dripping while <laughs> calling a plumber <laughs> and or putting plugs in our ears at night to try to get some sleep or, you know, dragging our blanket into a different room so we can finally get some sleep. In other words, we can take action while we accept the way it is. We can accept, uh, thinking back on uh, the last month or so, of a very beloved cat, a very dear friend of mine. He and I were com companions, and we clocked a lot of catitation time with him in my lap as I was meditating, uh, mutually meditating. <laughs> he was meditating I was, as I was gently, you know, rubbing his little back as I, as I meditated and, and all the rest of that. So I had to accept his decline, you know, the inevitability of death uh, of all mortal creatures, including ourselves and, and, and him. His name was Tsunami, like the tidal wave, because he was long and an amazing jumper. Uh, we can accept the reality of that while still trying to comfort our loved ones in their last weeks and days and hours. Uh, in my case, so uh, with my wife arranging for an extraordinary veterinarian to come to our home and, and eventually help to ease Tsunami um, out of this life. Uh, we could do both. It's not either or. It's a false choice between acceptance and action. If anything, stepping out of denial and being less clouded by and hijacked by our negative reactions of going uh, to things actually clears the field for us to act more effectively. And I draw a lot of inspiration and a lot of, uh, or I try to at least draw some wisdom from uh, social activists, uh, both in the past, no longer alive, um, and, and in the world today. Like, how do they do it? And the ones who can really sustain the good fight, I think, good trouble, as John Lewis, bless his memory, put it, uh, are ones who can live in this sweet spot in which, yeah, they, they're doing everything they can to make things better, while at the same time recognizing and um, being real about and in effect surrendered to the reality of things as they are. So now, easier said than done, but in principle, is possible to have both. So what can help us uh, move into a, a more of a stance of acceptance? And uh, while retaining the right to see what we see, uh, value what we value, and do what we do. One major resource um, is to rest in the heart. And in the meditation, you might have found that kind of hard. It was an ambitious meditation, right? Uh, I, I, you know, I just have kind of an attitude of let's go for it, see what happens. You know, if it's not perfect, that's a learning opportunity for me as well. Uh, and so, um, when we're rested in the heart, physiologically, that is very protective, and. Uh, refueling. It's nourishing to rest in the heart. Uh, neurologically, as we heighten our sense of sensation in this area, that tends to engage both branches of the vagus nerve network, the uh, ancient branch that moves downward from the spinal, you know, from the brain stem, to um, regulate the viscera. It's calming to rest in the heart. Also, the more recent branch of the vagus nerve complex goes up into the face and head. It's involved with relationships, especially social engagement. So as we move into the heart and related feelings that are inter interpersonal, that are social, like 
lovingness or supportiveness or you know and courage really is part of this as well uh, that is very helpful for us so just coming into the sense of our own heart is like a refuge itself it's interesting that uh, the root of the word for bodhicitta you know the qualities of the buddha citta or consciousness refers to the heart and often in uh, non-western cultures if you ask people sort of where are you in your body where are you coming from? Now, you know, Westerners tend to point to their head, me included, but they tend to point to the heart. And who knows what other energies, chakras, powers, who knows, uh, might be flowing through the heart as well. So um, just tuning into the heart centers us and grounds us as we face what is difficult. If it were not difficult, it'd be easy to accept. Acceptance is relevant for what's challenging, what's difficult. So right there. And then what I find very interestingly is that um, if we rest in the heart, as if we stay in touch with that sense, maybe it's just a small fraction of our stream of consciousness, the sense of heartness uh, as sensation and emotion and kind of attitude, stance, or maybe that quality of heartness is 98% of our consciousness, while only 2% is aware of this thing that we don't like, we don't want. It's hard to accept. Uh, but if we can maintain that sense of contact with heartness, while also being aware of this other thing or being able to renew that sense of heartness from time to time as we grapple with this other thing, what I find, and I am reading in the chats that many, many people I uh, have found that as well, that if we can just stay in touch with the hardness, right? It's like staying in touch with a buoy while the waves come and go. Yeah, the waves are coming, but you're staying in touch with the buoy, right? Hardness. Then it's a lot easier to deal with the things we um, don't like, don't want. And we can start to feel more, less flooded by them, less hijacked about them, and and also more resourceful. Because we, as we ground in the sense of the heart, that itself is resourcing us. And so in the face of what we don't like, rather than feeling immobilized, frozen, maybe based on a history of trauma that gets transferred into or, or brought into the current situation, understandably, given how the brain works, um, as we feel more resourced, then it's a, we don't feel so helpless in the face of what we don't like. And also, um, we become more straightforward about it. I mean, often we realize that some of the things we don't like, especially the ones that can't change, they just are what they are. And some of them, there's just no point in being preoccupied with. Now, some things we're trying to change, so we're actively engaged with them, we're sustained with them. But some things that are hard to accept, like certain kinds of losses or certain kinds of mistreatment where they got away with it and the truth is you'll never find justice about it. That's just real. They're untouchable, they're unreachable. You, whatever happened has happened. It's too late now, that was then. Whatever it is. Well, those kinds of things, as we rest in our heart, we start to realize, you know, it doesn't help me to remain preoccupied with that. It's not something I can do anything about. So why not rest in the heart rather than the complaint, the preoccupation, the lament, the reproach? It's not to deny the injustice, let's say, of whatever happened. It's not to scorn yourself or or to, you know, dismiss your own needs or, you know, it, it's more like to be generous to yourself and kind to yourself, such that as you rest in the heart, you can let that go. It's okay, you can let that go. And if it's something uh, at the scale of a leaky faucet or scaled all the way up to civil action to reduce the pace at least of global warming, um, as we rest in the heart, we feel more encouraged, we feel more cheerful, 
we feel more resilient, we feel more, we feel more able to keep on going. And that's, that makes an enormous difference. So I think what I want to do tonight in particular is to hear from you about what you find helps you to accept uh, the way it is while, when it's appropriate, doing what you can to improve it. And there are different words for this. People have different um, um, ways of talking about it. You know, I bring in my way, which is kind of California intellectual <laughs> you know, dude, white, uh, you know, in my 60s now kind of way. There are lots of other ways to talk about this. And before I open it up, I want to underline something that I said before we officially began tonight about tuning into it's helpful to be aware of the bodily sensations, the somatic markers of um, not accepting. You know, what does that feel like when we don't like it and we want to shove it away or whack it or deny it or make it disappear? You know, what's that feel like? You know, I have a sense of that. I was talking about some of the earliest uh, um, forms of autonomy for an infant is to spit out or turn away or look away. Uh, so there's that. Also, what are the somatic markers of acceptance? What's it feel like in your body to just surrender to the way it is? I mean, for me, there was a real transition, speaking of our cat, when I, I was really clear he wasn't gonna live forever, but I just kept sensing, uh, he and I were very close, uh, that there was something in him that continued to want to live, at least to the next breath, the next minute. But his body was failing. He was increasingly uncomfortable. And I just, with enormous sadness and grief, I, with my wife, came to the clarity that um, it was time to ease him out of this life. And I can feel that in my body right now. <sighs> What's that like? But there's a kind of release in the body when we just, you know, accept it. It is. What's that like for you in, in ways large and in small and small? Okay. So, and one more thing I should say, sorry, before I go, to be able to do anything in which we're trying to main con main, maintain awareness of two things at once which is very common, like compassion is an awareness of two things at once. We're aware empathically of suffering, theirs or ours, while at the same time, there's an awareness of benevolence, of supportiveness, warm-heartedness. We're not just merely empathic in a detached and indifferent way. We care about the pain that we are suffering with which is the root of the word for compassion. So two things at once, right? Sometimes we get hijacked by reactions or they strongly arise and then you you know start to talk yourself off the ledge a little bit. Now, 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 Rick, don't be a jerk. Take a breath. It's not a big deal. No need to keep honking at that person. Slow down. You know, we're aware of two things at once. It's not uncommon to be aware of two things at once. So the question is, how do we stabilize our sense of contact with, or in touchness with, the buoy, right? The refuge, what we, what we want to maintain a sense of. Our higher wisdom, you know, the better angels of our nature. How do we do that, right? Well, the primary way we do that is we train, we develop, we cultivate those qualities inside us. Hardwired, fundamentally, into our own body, particularly our brain. And we develop them as traits. And as we develop them as traits, it's kind of like building out the buoy or strengthening the muscles that maintain contact with the buoy. Not white knuckling it, but stability of uh, relatedness to the buoy. We train in these things. So we can train in heartfeltness. And then as we train in this, just as in anything, we explore challenges. We challenge ourselves a little bit 
as one, not the only, but one way to train. And then we were able to maintain heartfeltness, let's say, with someone we mostly really like who's done some tiny little thing that's irksome. And then we raise the challenge level a smidge. That's a very technical term, psychologically, a smidge. We just raise the challenge level a smidge. And then, you know, then there's the next level of challenge and the next one after that. So people in the chats were talking about uh, being, you know, doing, trying my practice, which is a form of linking. If you know my heal model, have, enrich, and absorb, and then link, potentially two things at once. Um, it, you know, the, it's natural to get kind of carried away by, I'll call it the negative material, the, that which we don't want, we don't accept at first. It's not understandable. If you get carried away by it, if it's too powerful for you, recenter in the positive qualities you want to take refuge in, you want to maintain contact with, recenter there, and then maybe lower the challenge level. Or once you're recentered, then go back in touch with whatever's difficult for you. you know? And over time, there, there are many trainings in heartfeltness. Um, and a lot of research, actually, that people can develop traits of heartfeltness who, that, are, that involve and are increasingly evidenced by underlying physical changes of neural structure and function. Okay. So, um, let's see here. Many good things coming in. I have a lot of uh, things I could talk about, so I'm going to make some choices here. And then in a moment, if someone would like to ask a succinct question that would have general interest related to the topic at hand, that's kind of what I'm looking for here, uh, I would really like to get your voice in this space besides my own. Okay, so let's just see. Seems like a lot of people are finding that this heartfeltness is actually useful in dealing with what we don't like. Um, let's see. I'm seeing many good comments coming in. I appreciate the sweetness for our cat and our family. Uh, let's see. Okay, great. This is a key question. Elaine, you can see it in the chat at 7.05 p.m. Elaine asked this question, what is the difference between being judgmental about a person or situation and maintaining your values? This is very interesting. It has to do with you know, the meaning of the words judgment um, because judgment has a kind of pejorative connotation, like we're really critical or sneering or you know, even prejudiced about them. Uh, I sometimes use the word evaluation there's no escape from values. There's an architecture of valuing in our body, going all the way down to molecular processes inside our cells that are trying to maintain homeostasis of one sort rather than getting knocked out of that resting state or promote various goals. So we're gonna have goals. There's no way around it. To wanna have no goals uh, is a goal. So, what I think the distinction is a lot is the top spin we add to the discernment. So we can see facts, that's discerning, and then we can relate those facts to values. Or that's an evaluation, judgment. You know, this is more skillful than that. I think feeding children is more is better than not feeding children. I think stopping at red lights, you know, is more skillful than not stopping at red lights. I think if you have an emergency and you're at a, and you're coming to a red light and you see the coast is clear and you got to get your partner your kid to the hospital you go it's more skillful to go through the red light you know it's somewhat situation dependent but I think we can we can weigh that um, where we get judgmental is when we have ill will the Buddha really highlighted and flagged ill will where we want to tear people down we have contempt for them disdain we see them as its rather than thou's. So these for me are key distinctions between what let's call being judgmental and being evaluative and discerning. So for example, to ourselves, we can recognize, ugh, we did something that wasn't skillful. We might even have the wince of healthy remorse about it, which, is a, which can help us take the high road next time. But um, we don't need to, be mean to ourselves. 
You know, it, you just think about, um, in some ways it can really ground this to bring it down to what it's like to be a kid, you know, mean. You know, what I'm, what I'm trying to say is we know as kids what it's like to be mean, what it's like to want to hurt. We probably know this as adults too. These are qualities that are dropped into being judgmental. But I think it's critically important in a kind of major error. I'm not saying, Elaine, that this is what you're saying, but I think a major error slipped in to, um, you know, spiritual thinking, mindfulness thinking, a certain amount of progressive thinking that, you know, every all th- sides are the same. <clears throat> Everybody does it. Both sides do it, you know. Uh, and you know, moral relativism. And I, I think that, no, we can preserve our discernment and we can hold on to our values, including our own personal integrity. And we can recognize in light of that, that some actions are better than others. Some people, frankly, are more skillful than others. Some people are producing more benefit and less harm than other people are. Some people clearly uh, can be seen as motivated primarily by supportiveness and honesty and decency, while other people can be seen, discerned in, with some growing clarity as motivated primarily by self-centeredness and um, ill will toward others. We see these things. We can see these things uh, and act morally and decently without falling into the pitfalls of ill will and the kind of problems of being judgmental. I actually find paradoxically that as people claim for themselves, especially if they've been part of groups that have been through acculturation, through socialization, have been disempowered or told that they don't matter so much or they're second tier or they're outsiders to the dominant culture, the dominant paradigm, you know, especially if that's been the case, it's really important. And I find that as people claim for themselves the right to just stand in the truth as they see it and to call it like they see it, including the relevant values, in a funny kind of way, as you rest in the dignity of that and the potency of that and the fearlessness of that, righteousness as a problem and ill will and contempt and disdain tends to fall away. And increasingly, you don't hate your adversaries. The Dalai Lama talks about this. But you can also be really angry at them. <laughs> okay. Does someone have a comment or question? I'm going to just scroll through the screens to see if someone has a succinct, clear question. No judgment here. <laughs> that is related to our topics of general interest. Anybody want to? Stick their neck out. Uh, uh, anybody want to raise their hand? Maybe you raise your hand, you know, push the hand button, or just wave your hand. I'll see it when I scroll through the screens if your camera's on. Anybody? Nobody? Did I frighten you with my standards? <laughs> Probably. Sorry about that. Okay. I'll do, we have about 15 more minutes. I'll just take another crack at questions, comments coming in through the chat. Okay, great. Peter's iPhone. Peter, do you have your hand raised? I, your camera's not on. No? I'm not seeing your, if I don't see your face on your camera, I can't call on you. Okay, so I'm gonna, Peter, do you wanna say something? Yes? All right, so now I have to ask to unmute. Hmm, how do I unmute you? There we go. Okay, good. It's um, it for a while. I just I was deaf and dumb because because I couldn't. Um, well, hi. I I want to say the <clears throat> your meditation that you gave us, uh, heartfulness. I remember you saying that sort yeah. of rest in heartfulness and being present. Um, the um. I really liked it. I resisted it because I have chronic fatigue mm-hmm. and just there's something about just the effort of being present is yeah. there's a distasteful quality. And yet 
there's also some joy in it at the same time. And um, uh, I, I don't know what I can say, except it was, I, what I did was I, I turned to as much of the unpleasantness of the sensation as I could. And I also took what you were, the basic message that you're sending us, which is basically one of hope that we can actually be and exist in this universe meaningfully, that there is some sort of overall transformative process that we're in. Mm. And, and to even feel that at all is, is huge mm. in terms of bearing other things, bearing pain of and discomfort. Yeah. And, um, I, I really appreciate this thing that you do every week with us. Um, and part of it is, it's for me, it's like, a, it's a nice slow grade going upward. And it's slow enough that I can take that one inch of elevation, you know? Um, and so I just want to say that, that it, it's for me, it's like coaching, uh, coaxing a, a shy animal mm. to be willing, you know, or a child. Yeah. And I, I just use one desire after another to lead me on. And um, uh, so the, the amount of pleasantness that you bring into the entire process is really important when one is run down neurologically in some way, you know, or tired or fatigued yeah. it's that there, there, there is some infinitesimal step that i can always take mm. and that's the refuge anyway oh, so thank you peter that's very touching and this this gathering is a tremendous refuge for me i always look forward to it and um i feel very buoyed and and buoyed right and hardened and fed and nourished by all of you really uh, whether I can see your face or not, I, I know you're there somehow. So I want to say thank you. And I also want to underline what you said about the importance of small steps. Now, you you may have heard the, the proverb, uh, think not lightly of good, saying it will not come to me. Drop by drop is the water pot filled. Likewise, the wise one, gathering it little by little, fills oneself with good. That's a fundamental teaching from the Dhammapada, and it's a hallmark. <laughs> it's very on brand for me in terms of taking in the good, you know, one breath at a time, one minute at a time, one synapse at a time. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to add uh, and build on, really, what you said um, is the Buddhist metaphor that many people are probably familiar with of the first and second dart. The first dart is something like chronic fatigue neurological disturbance or the condition in a country. Uh, the fact of the matter is, since agriculture developed 10,000 years ago, most people who have ever lived have lived under the thumb of various authoritarian rulers uh, in layered structures as you know, elites gathered uh, wealth and power through surpluses, et cetera, et cetera. That's 10,000 years of human history. Uh, through Game of Thrones all the way to the present moment. And it doesn't make it better to recognize that. It is a first dart, right, to live under tyranny or to have uh, disruptions in the electoral, electoral process in your own country or, or to deal with a plague or to deal with racial injustice. Uh, you know, these are the first darts of life. They, they are what they are. The Buddha pointed out, though, that very often we add our reactions to them. Chronic illness, the inevitable death of a cat. Uh, I have family members who grapple with chronic illness and chronic pain in ways that affect me directly and indirectly and certainly vastly affect them. These are first darts. The question is, do we have to throw second darts ourselves of aversion, resistance, you know, disdain, um, dehumanization, cruelty, self-blame, you know, we, right? Uh, and what acceptance can do for us is really reduce the second darts we throw. Yeah, yeah 
I'm going to keep on going, if that's okay, unless you had a final comment there, Peter. Well, just, just the final, final one that is really implicit in everything you're saying is there's times when anything feels like too much. And it's, it's to just take the, a speck of dust of a step. It's, you know, it's, if, if, if it's just then acknowledging that, that anything feels too much, but it's, there's always some teeny, teeny, teeny amount of acknowledgement that I can do as yeah. a step. Yeah. Yeah. And if I, I appreciate uh, what you're saying, I want to build on that too, including related. So I am now going to talk about, uh, you know, the larger process of societal scale change. And one of the things that helps us accept the first darts is to claim agency for ourselves to do whatever we can do. Agency is a fancy word. It just means, basically means that we experience ourselves as potent in some regard. We can, you know, we're a cue ball, not an eight ball in some regard. We're a hammer rather than a nail in some regard. We're a cause rather than an effect in some regard. In, in which can include simply getting through the next minute of this, uh, the next breath of this agonizing pain. But at least somewhere there's a sense of agency. Agency supports acceptance. If there is a first art condition that we feel absolutely immobilized in relationship to, including in our own reactions, huh, that's very disturbing. And it then and we really get we get glued to the thing we don't like, right? It's like chained to it in some way. On the other hand, related to societal change at any and all scales, when we take a little bit of action, it helps us be more at peace with the way it is. The little action being to vote, whoever you vote for. <laughs> Just Turn in your damn ballot. <laughs> you know, care enough about others, even if you don't care about yourself, to participate in a civic process that's the bedrock of democracy, which is an extraordinary and rare accomplishment in the 10,000 history of tyranny that we've had. So anyway, any sense of agency. And I think back on uh, Vidya Mala Birch, a friend of mine, a wonderful teacher about dealing with chronic pain, who talks about being in the hospital in the middle of intense and agonizing pain and realizing that it was going to be her lot for the rest of her life as a young woman in her very early 20s. And she just could not contemplate getting through the next day, let alone the next 50 years. And she suddenly had a breakthrough moment she talks about very eloquently in which she realized all she had to get through was this moment because it because experience is always in the present, the eternal now. And that was revelatory for her because she knew she could get through this moment and this moment and this moment, right? Like that for her was a form of agency with in her relationship to an intractable condition. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. It's okay? Yeah. Okay, great. All right, great. So... I'm seeing people, are you advising me to slow down? <laughs> I probably should. <laughs> okay. Uh, somebody asked a little earlier a key question um, about, so I see it's in general, yes, we slowing down is really important. Um, I think it's very important to find different ways into the sense of heartness you know, and you'll find your own. Uh, I like open-hearted, warm-hearted, friendly. In the Buddhist tradition, uh, the root of the word for loving kindness uh, in Pali is friendliness. Just being a little friendly, you know, being uh, a good neighbor. Uh, think of people who for you are embodiments of the combination of strength and heart maybe from different cultures or with different different qualities about it. Uh, 
I think back on one of my actually critically important life teachers, uh, assist, uh, a woman named Carol Hetrick. Uh, I've spoken of briefly. She was an assistant dean at UCLA when I became president of my dormitory at the ripe age of 17. I had no skills whatsoever, <laughs> socially and interpersonally. Uh, and I learned so much from Carol. And one of the things of strength and heart. She was compassionate. She was wide open, but she saw what she saw and she retained, you know, the two together. So maybe that's a model for you, whoever that is in your own life. Think about models of that for you. Uh, sensations in the heart. Now, key point, tuning into sensations in the heart might well associate to feelings of sorrow or pain. And as an important point too, I think one thing that really supports acceptance is becoming open to anguish, open to heartbreak at injustice for so many others. And this is a kind of work that I'm exploring myself, particularly these days, around racial injustice. It's to open to anguish, not to be swallowed up by it or overwhelmed by it, although it can be very intense for a while, but to be large enough and moral enough to not use privilege to avoid being anguished about the injustices visited upon so many people from which sometimes one might be advantaged to really feel that. Um, that's a lot, right? How do you actually do that? So it's understandable that when we tune into the heart, other things can arise. Anguish, uh, feelings of loneliness or being unloved by others, going back into our own attachment history and childhood. It's understandable. And the way to be about that, you know, is to be aware of how we get tugged away from the object of attention we're trying to maintain. This is fundamental, this mindfulness 101, trying to, you know, maintain the stability of uh, resting attention on some object of attention, like our own buoy, and then be mindful of being pulled away and then come back to it. So it's okay. It's understandable if other things arise and then come back to the heart. And um, the last thing I would just like to offer is that, um, I think we all know that we can trust the heart. We can trust the heart. We may not know exactly what to do. We, we may need to pause. We may need to slow down, as people have been advising in the chat. Um, but at the end of the day, we all have a good heart. Now, for some people, I think that good heart is, ooh <laughs> you need a telescope to find it, or a microscope. <laughs> really look. But... <laughs> You know, I think everybody has a good heart deep down. I'm going to take a stand there. Uh, you might have to get really young, really at infant levels of development, but still a good heart. And um, you all have a good heart. And acknowledging your own good heart and naming it to yourself, and if, if appropriate, naming it to others, you know, our deep Buddha nature, our deep natural goodness, true nature, radiant fundamental goodness, good intentions, supportiveness, wanting to help rather than hurt. Um, it's in your core. It's true. And you can rely upon it and take refuge in it and, and live from it and be lived by it and practice and train and develop in these ways. That's our opportunity for ourselves uh, and certainly for other people. So how about we just sit for a minute let this sink in, kind of let it land the final minute here, and then we'll end formally. And those who want can stick around after a few minutes to talk about this, if you like, in breakout rooms. Feeling your own heart, coming home.
I appreciate your heart.